first learned what war was about when I was my son's age. My favorite uncle was killed on a bombing mission over Germany in World War II. Did they ever talk about the, the war in our school, Nick? In French, we talked um, the day before um, Remembrance Day, we talked about war, yeah. What'd they say? About the Second World War. What'd they say? The army wasn't that bad. They were, this camp has got um, the peacekeeping role. Yeah. When my uncle died, my parents dealt with my despair and confusion by telling me about the gathering of peace-loving nations about to take place in San Francisco. Here in 1945, Canada was one of the founding members of the United Nations. It was supposed to, quote, save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Our government, under Mackenzie King, led the fight to have medium powers represented on the Security Council so that peacemaking would not be left entirely up to the big powers. U.S. President Harry Truman expressed all the hopes of my parents' generation for a peaceful world. There were many who doubted that agreement could ever be reached by these 50 countries differing so much in race and religion, in language and culture. But these differences were all forgotten in one unshakable unity of determination to find a way to end war. Two months after Truman's speech at the UN, he dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and the nuclear arms race was on. Forty-five years later, another U.S. president expressed the hopes of my generation at the end of the Cold War. It is in our hands to leave these dark machines behind, the dark ages where they belong, and to press forward to cap a historic movement towards a new world order and a long era of peace. George Bush's appearance at the UN in October 1990 was in response to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. The annexation of Kuwait will not be permitted to stand. President Bush showed what he meant by sending 400,000 U.S. troops into Saudi Arabia. He also managed to persuade 27 of the U.N.'s 160 members to contribute money and men to a military coalition under U.S. command. Canada participated by sending three warships to enforce the U.N. trade embargo against Iraq. These ships would account for a quarter of all the interceptions made at sea during the five months of the pre-war blockade. The resulting shortages of food and jobs forced two million foreign workers to flee Iraq and Kuwait. They flooded through Jordan on their way home to the poorest countries of Asia and the Middle East. Canada donated $25 million to feed them, but did not support France and the Soviet Union in their efforts to negotiate a settlement with Iraq. Instead, Canada co-sponsored a UN Security Council resolution approving President Bush's plan to attack. Canada has followed a resolute and unswerving course. We have chosen to stand with the United Nations. We have chosen to stand against aggression. And we have chosen to stand up and be counted when freedom and world peace was under serious challenge. In the 44 days of the war, 
coalition bombers would drop the equivalent in explosive power to five Hiroshima bombs. It took the U.S. five years to drop a similar amount on Vietnam. Two squadrons of Canadian Hornet fighters flew sweeping escort missions ahead of U.S. bombers. Canadian ships were responsible for supplying the coalition fleet in the Gulf with food, fuel, and ammunition. At home, many Canadians objected that we were betraying our identity as a peacekeeper and that sanctions hadn't been given enough time to work. represents the same old way of doing things. War is madness, Mr. Speaker. The option of killing people to resolve disputes must disappear in a new world order. Here, here. Many other Canadians believed that Saddam Hussein was getting exactly what he deserved. We won't wait for diplomacy. With your weapons, we haven't the time. We'll come right away and we'll blow you to hell for your heinous global crime. At first, it looked like Saddam's war machine was being hit neat and clean. Later, I learned that 93% of the bombs dropped on Iraq were unguided or free-falling bombs. That over half of them missed their targets. And that most of the victims were civilians. Images like this made me feel ashamed to be a Canadian. Here we were helping Uncle Sam to establish his new world order in the old American way. Shouldn't we as Canadians be using our reputation as peacekeepers to help the UN find a different way to settle the international disputes? I went to Kuwait eight months after the war was over. It was covered with a blanket of soot and sulfur, left by the hundreds of oil fires set by the Iraqis. Between them, Iraq and Kuwait contained 20% of the world's oil reserves. Whoever owns this much oil can influence the price of crude on the world market and is a central player in a global power game. Saddam Hussein had accused Kuwait of extracting more than its share of the oil fields that crossed the common border between the two countries. This is Kuwait City, home of 600,000 Kuwaitis and almost a million foreign workers. 
Several thousand Kuwaitis had been killed or captured during the Iraqi occupation. But for the survivors, life seemed to be returning to normal. The riches of the oil had reached almost every Kuwaiti. But in our society, in our culture, we do not like to talk about our wealth and our rich. We're supposed to keep it quiet. We should thank God and be grateful to him. And accordingly, uh, we're supposed to look modest. Uh, the fact that you see many uh, people driving Mercedes-Benz, Mercedes-Benz became the popular car in Kuwait. And not because it is something uh, specifically uh, outstanding uh, for one person. And on the other hand is that it is easier to maintain a Mercedes-Benz here than a Honda because of the economy of the scale. Wherever you go, uh, people would like uh, to fix a Mercedes. The spare parts are available. So you are better off to drive a Mercedes-Benz in Kuwait than a Honda. I hope the Japanese wouldn't get mad about this. Professor Al Abdullah was chairman of the political science department at the University of Kuwait. It's a very peaceful community. And you can see people from Asia, from Africa, uh, from the Arab world. They are all participating and doing something. But the story I heard from the foreign workers was different. They had returned from six months of exile during the war to discover that for them, the new world order was not much different from the old. They still got paid 10 to $20 a day their passports were still confiscated by their employers, and they still had no chance to become citizens, no matter how long they stayed. Of course, they were treated like this in all states of the Persian Gulf. Some Bengali workers invited me to visit them in a room that 10 of them shared. I found a happier group of foreign workers in the desert. They were bringing the last decapped oil well under control. And they were earning up to $1,000 a day. They were Canadians working for Mike Miller, the president of Safety Boss of Calgary. So I think that this will, uh, will stand in oil field history is, is possibly one of the greatest accomplishments of the oil field, really in terms of an international disaster of such a, you know, as I understand, one of the biggest scales of certainly man-made ever. had put out 172 of Kuwait's oil fires, more than any of the 18 participating countries. Further to the south, Emir Jabir al-Sabah and his friends were out to celebrate the end of the oil fires. The Emir is a constitutional monarch, but most of his ministers are members of his own family and they have total control of the country's oil assets. They've made Kuwait indispensable to the West by investing most of their extraordinary wealth in stocks, bonds, and real estate in Europe 
and North America. That's the Emir and the Crown Prince hidden by the security guards. They've come out to thank the oil workers for bringing the fires under control way ahead of schedule. This made it easier for Kuwait to pay the US the $16 billion they had charged for liberating the country. The speaker is Kuwait's Minister of Oil. Tomorrow, more sunshine and slightly warmer temperatures. With the winds from the south at 17 miles per hour... There were still 10,000 U.S. troops in Kuwait when I was there, and three of their warships anchored in the harbor. One of the reasons Saddam had invaded Kuwait was to get this kind of access to the Persian Gulf. The helicopters taxiing to and from the American ships were a constant reminder of the region's strategic importance. The Islamic call to prayer has been echoing over the Persian Gulf for 1,300 years. Not until the discovery of oil in this century did it become a battleground for the empires of Europe. The British took Baghdad from the Ottoman Turks in World War I. They created a kingdom called Iraq and bestowed the crown on a sheikh from Arabia in payment for his services during the war. The new king, Faisal I, complained that without the neighboring Ottoman province of Kuwait, Iraq would not have adequate access to the Persian Gulf. But the British had already guaranteed Kuwait to another sheikh, Al Sabah, in return for their control of his foreign affairs. British capital, commerce, and naval power in the Persian Gulf gave them predominant control over half of the world's oil reserves for the next three decades. Faisal II, educated in England, inherited the crown of Iraq at the age of 18. In 1955, he signed a military alliance with Britain and Turkey called the Baghdad Pact. It was designed to defend Western oil interests against the Soviet Union and the rising tide of Arab nationalism. But the Baghdad Pact alienated Faisal even further from his people. In 1958, he was deposed and executed by a military junta representing the lower classes who had not shared in the wealth of oil. This meant the end of British predominance in the Middle East and a serious threat to Western oil supplies. In 1968, while Trudeau mania was sweeping Canada, the Ba'ath Party seized power in Baghdad. It had a program of social reform 
to be paid for by nationalizing the oil industry. In 1979, Saddam Hussein took over a repressive regime that consisted mostly of family and friends from his hometown. He decided that the time had come for Iraq to take control of the Persian Gulf. First, he tried invading Iran. The United Nations took no action against him. The big powers, all members of the Security Council, kept both sides supplied with enough weapons to keep the war going for eight years. After a million casualties, Saddam gave up and turned on Kuwait. But there, he was in for a big surprise. had an arsenal of new high-tech weapons that had been waiting for the test of war. These million-dollar cruise missiles had guidance systems of the kind that Lytton Systems produced in Toronto up to 1988. Within a week, they knocked out most of Iraq's power stations. This left 18 million people without hospitals and factories that could function. The success of these and other weapons used against Iraq resulted in a record crowd at an aerospace weapons show that I attended seven months after the war was over. It was held in Dubai, a small emirate down the Gulf Coast from Kuwait. Now to the last of the fighters and the last of the aircraft in the show this afternoon. This, the General Dynamics, F-16 Fighting Falcon, one of the most successful fighters in the world. Something like 3,000 of these on order, of which about 2,500 to be delivered in Turkey and in Europe, as well as in the United States. This is the current F-16C of some 27,500 pounds. All the big weapons producers were there, hungry for new markets now that the Cold War was over. For 20 years, the Middle East had been their prime export market. In the wake of the Gulf War, business was booming. If Iraq was no longer buying, others were. Canada produces $3 billion worth of military goods per year, putting 100,000 workers in arms-related industries and ranking us about the 10th largest arms exporter in the world. Orlacan Aerospace was there from St. John, Quebec, displaying its anti-aircraft missile system, with some assistance from the Canadian Army. Inside the main hangar, Bristol Aerospace of Winnipeg was promoting its air-to-ground rockets. Now, how do prospects look? Oh, I think very optimistic. Yes, in spite of the Cold War being over and, and oh, people yes. are uh, changing priorities. Regrettably, because of international tensions, the priorities can change, but they're Unfortunately, it'll always be a requirement for avionics updates or yeah. a rocket weapon system, uh -huh. aircraft components. Yeah. It will continue. 
was in a tent somewhere in this desert in 1922 that the British High Commissioner for Iraq, Sir Percy Cox, drew lines in the sand establishing the borders between Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. And here is where most of the enemy was in the Gulf War. An army of conscripts holed up in bunkers with no effective air defense. They were bombed around the clock. I couldn't help but think of what a different role Canada played the last time the major powers were involved in a war in the Middle East. It was in 1956. The British, French and Israelis had attacked Egypt when it nationalized the Suez Canal. The Soviets threatened to intervene, and the U.S. threatened sanctions. The United Nations met in emergency session. In the General Assembly, where decisions could be taken by a majority vote, Canada's Minister of External Affairs proposed a new role for the United Nations. Fellow delegates, the immediate purpose of our meeting as a, an assembly tonight is to bring about, as soon as possible, a ceasefire and the withdrawal of forces in the area which we are considering from contact and from conflict with each other. Our longer range purpose is to find solutions for the problems which have finally exploded into this fighting and conflict. Lester Pearson proposed to separate the opponents with a neutral force under UN command. It would be made up of units from small and medium powers. The commander of this first UN peacekeeping force was a Canadian, as were 1,000 of the 6,000 troops in blue helmets. With their arrival, the invaders were able to negotiate the terms of an honorable withdrawal. The diploma and the gold medal. I think Pearson's winning of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1957 was a great moment for Canada. It defined and celebrated a special peacekeeping role for our country in the dark days of the Cold War. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, members of the committee, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. Many men have seemed to like war each time before it began. Well, perhaps this has all changed now. And if it hasn't, it certainly should have. For surely by now the glamour has gone out of war. Over the next three decades, 80,000 Canadian soldiers served in UN peacekeeping missions around the world, more than any other country. I found these Canadian military engineers cleaning up the mess in the demilitarized zone in southern Iraq after the Gulf War. The blue hats indicate that they are under UN command. Nobody had worn these hats during the war, which had been fought under US command. But does the color of blue mean that real peacekeeping is being done? I'm not sure. Pearson's idea in 1956 
had been that the UN would only set up and administer a demilitarized zone at the invitation of the opponents. The purpose was to get them negotiating. In this war, the UN had been one of the belligerents, and there was no negotiation. This is an anti-personnel cluster bomb dropped by a B-52. It contained hundreds of baseball-sized bomblets that the Canadians would have to clean up. Sometimes an Iraqi kid would get to them first and lose a limb. He'd be treated in this building, a former Iraqi military hospital being converted into UN headquarters by the Canadian engineers. They had a thing that out with the list of how many people lost legs, yes. right legs, left legs, arms. There were some lost a couple legs, some lost, like, had both arms. It was on the Iraqi television that uh, if they did pick it up, they would get paid, compensated. Oh, it was on TV? Oh, yes. Even They were even told that if they'd bring back a tank into the country, they could rest for, a, for probably a whole $10, year. $10,000. Yeah, they'd be uh, on easy street for a long time. But not everybody wanted to take that risk. It was... Uh, all these Normed guys were working like slaves, running from the chopper to here. Then the Canadian soldiers got involved because it was going crazy. Normeds were exhausted. So the guys starting, uh, some one guy volunteered to burn the limbs and another guy volunteered to do, uh, to do IVs or to hold the guy down or to do a lot so of odd you, jobs. You got involved in that. Yes, we all did. Yeah. You never get to see anything like this back home either. So it's an experience in yourself. Yes. Just seeing you know, what the mines can do. You see it, but you don't really realize how For bad sure. until you see it. Faced with starvation, Iraqis from the local town of Umm Qasar did odd jobs for the Canadian engineers. They could only be paid army food rations and bottles of water because Saddam had forbidden them to work for the UN. I was in, a, in one of the houses here in Umm Qasar, one of my employees. He's got a young wife, about 22, three young kids. If we were in America, it would be a dump. Nobody would be allowed to live there. But I got there with a bit of candy, two bottles of cold water. He made me feel at home. He made me feel welcome. In his house? In his house, and he was very nice. His wife was uh, very happy, and his kids were fun. And then we talked about the shelling of this bunker down here, and he said, uh, there's people that haven't come out yet, so. And he said, uh, his kids cried for a whole week after the shelling. He says. You know, what have I got to do with this? My kids and my government, is it's not the same. Nasser Shema. He's an Iraqi musician I met in Jordan on my way home. He's playing a piece he composed for a fellow lute player who lost his right arm in the war. Baghdad is a من حبيبتي my من كل شيء بالدنيا عز من حبيبتي الروحية لأن ما كانت تضرب بغداد كنت أود لو أمتلك عباءة كبيرة وأصعد فوق سماء بغداد أو غطيها وحتى يكون الضرب على على أجنحتي وعلى عظامي وجسمي ولا يخترق ويشوه بغداد هذه المدينة اللي اللي عمرها تجاوز الألف عام وتج وفيها الفنون وفيها الثقافة وفيها الأدب وفيها الشعراء الكبار وفيها المتنبي وفيها أعظم أعظم مبدعين العرب a team of American and Canadian doctors toured Iraq after the war. They reported that tens of thousands of civilians were dying from malnutrition and epidemic diseases brought on by the destruction of electrical sewage and pumping systems. 
contaminated drinking water helped push up the infant mortality rate to four times what it had been before the war. وانا احد افراد الشعب وكنت جندي اثناء الحرب وتركت الاتي الموسيقيه عودي وحملت رشاشي حالي حال اي عراقي كان مستعد يفدي روحه ويفدي اي شيء لاجل وطنه وبدانا بمحاوله وبالتهيب لصد اي هجمه ممكن ان تكون على العراق لكن اللي صار كان اكبر من ان تكون مواجهه بالسلاح Coalition troops entered Kuwait at the end of February 1991. 500,000 of them. They met little resistance. This is what some of them found. Thousands of vehicles and charred bodies clogging the main highway from Kuwait to Iraq. Canadian fighter planes had participated in an attack on convoys of Iraqi conscripts who were following an order to retreat. Most of Saddam's professional soldiers had been called home before the ground war began. If I'd have listened to the leader of the United States Senate, George Mitchell, Saddam Hussein would be in Saudi Arabia and you'd be paying 20 bucks a gallon for gasoline. Now try that one on for size. I'm getting sick and tired. I am every single night hearing one of these carping little liberal Democrats jumping all over my you know, you know what. And I can't wait for this campaign. Canadian ships returned home in April 1991. 240 Allied lives had been lost, none of them Canadian. Saddam Hussein's attempt to get control of the Persian Gulf had been stopped, but not the threat of further wars. The biggest arms buildup in the history of the Middle East was already underway. I'm not sure traditional peacekeeping is enough anymore. Mm, no. Since World War II, close to 20 million people have been killed in a hundred wars. I'd like my son to grow up in a different world, one in which money now invested in weapons would be used to eliminate poverty and arbitrate international disputes. At one point in Lester Pearson's time, a majority of Canadians favored turning over foreign policy and all armaments to a world parliament. I hope my son lives to see that happen. The stark and inescapable fact is that today we cannot defend our society by war. And therefore, surely, the best defense of peace is not power, but the removal of the cause of the war. And international agreements which will put peace on a stronger foundation than the terror of destruction. 